Welcome to part 14 of the Book of Esther podcast. I'm going to begin today by reading Psalm 121, a song of degrees. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even for evermore. Here in this psalm we have strong encouragement to seek and to trust the Lord. In all of our trials, in all of our difficulties, in all the things that beset us in this life, we are encouraged to trust the Lord. We are assured of the Lord's goodness to us. and We are assured of his interest in us, his provision for us, his mercy towards us, his blessing upon us, both from this time forth and forevermore. Father, we pray that you bless this time and that during this time we would learn good things from your word. We pray that you prepare us to serve you in these days. We pray you cleanse us from our sins and from our iniquities in the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son. Thank you for our beloved Saviour, Father, that you sent him and gave him to take away the sins of the world, to be our Saviour, to be the Saviour of all those who put their trust in him. Father, I pray that you would give us this help as we look up to you, as we look to you and cry out to you in these days. We pray for this help and for this strength, Lord, to walk a narrow path, to walk a straight path in a crooked and perverse generation. Father, we pray that you'd help us and, Lord, that you would make clear to us what your <clears throat> paths and your um, directions are for us, Lord, so that we might also find grace in your eyes and the strength to obey you and to follow Jesus, to take up our cross daily and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray and ask that you would also help us in all our distresses, in all our difficulties, in all our needs, in all our wants, Lord, in all our um, burdens which beset us and Lord have mercy upon us may we look to Jesus in all things <clears throat> may we seek him seek his glory and <clears throat> lay hold of him always for that mercy and that goodness that is promised within your word and so father we pray you bless this time to us now and we ask these things in Jesus precious name amen well, as usual in this podcast, what I want to do is to just consider several items which are important to us as Christians from the news, briefly, and also um, to uh, consider, uh, then go on to a consideration of the book of Esther, and we've, we've reached chapter 3 of the book of Esther, and we're going to be considering what it means for a Christian to stand up for the truth to, in these days, something which we all need to consider, something which we all need to be prepared to do. As the days grow darker and as the world encroaches upon our churches and upon us as individual Christians, we have much to learn from the book of Esther on how to take a stand for the truth and how to honour God and how to stand up in the face of evil when that evil is determined against us and against the cause of Christ. But before that, I just want to consider some of those things that are in the news. And uh, we're coming to consider the One Love armbands and the World Cup in a second. But first of all, I just want to speak about the work that is going on. As you know, I work now as a Christian evangelist and uh, much uh, gospel preaching, I believe, has been going on in Hull, especially here, because this is where I live. It's a city in the east of England. It's about um, <clears throat> 30 miles from any other towns and 50 miles from any other cities. And as such, it's um, almost like um, <clears throat> a separate country in some ways. Uh, it's a friendly place to live. It's, a, it's an interesting place to live. And uh, it's a place with 260,000 souls. And there is a very significant opportunity here to preach the gospel of Christ, to speak to people, to share the gospel with those who are perishing. And yet the work is very great. The workers are very few. There are a number of Christian churches here in Hull. We thank God for that. But the work continues. And the desire of this ministry is to be an encouragement to believers, particularly via the internet, and also to be a Christian witness to those who are perishing all around. 
By God's grace, uh, much work is being done. <clears throat> there is much more work that needs to be done. I'm hoping that soon there will be other Christians who I can work with here in Hull for the furtherance of Christ's cause. Uh, I'm hoping soon also for a building in which I can teach the word of God, in which I can instruct others. I'm hoping also that we will, above all, that we will see conviction of sin, that we will see the Holy Spirit of God come down in convicting power on those who are perishing, and that we will see with our own eyes <clears throat> those who are being saved, those who are being brought into the kingdom of God, those who are being born again of God's Holy Spirit and transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And so by God's grace, I hope and pray that we will see uh, many good things in Hull and in other places as well. Some of you might be wondering about the Welsh chapels uh, which I was preaching in uh, a year ago. Those chapels are still there. That work still needs to be done. That work is still on my mind. It's still something that I'm praying about and looking at. And I will eventually go back and visit those chapels again. But we mustn't think of the chapels only in Wales. We must think of the people of Wales. With or without chapels, the people need the Lord Jesus Christ. And for them to know the Lord Jesus Christ, they need those who preach the gospel to them. Now, there are Christian ministers in Wales. There are Christian preachers in Wales. We pray that God would bless them. We pray, Lord, that the people would once again be awakened by the power of God's Spirit, awakened to their lostness, awakened to the truth of the gospel. The chapels, the benefit of the chapels is simply this, that they are places that have been designed and built with one aim in mind, that the word of God should be preached. And there may be few other places in the land that can be used in that capacity. Some of them have had a great history of gospel preaching. Some of them, I suspect, haven't. But these buildings were built for one purpose, for the preaching of God's word. But the, the moment, at the moment, the majority of the people seem utterly indifferent to the word of God. In a time of great trials and difficulties for the ordinary person, problems with heating, problems with food, uh, problems with uh, an oppressive or, or uh, an increasingly intrusive government and um, the uh, rise of cultural Marxism and all of these other things that are going on. But the people are not yet awakened. They're not yet um, hearing the gospel or ready to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if we love the people of Wales, if we love Wales, and I speak as an Englishman, then we will pray for Wales and we will pray that God would pour out his spirit there. And if he does, then we greatly desire and greatly long that that would also come to England and that the English also would hear the word of God and hearing the voice of the Son of Man that they might live. So there is a work going on. There is a work that needs to be done. There's a work that is in progress. This work, I pray, by God's grace will grow and will prosper under the hand of God. As I commit it to the Lord, as I, as a, as a Christian worker, lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. As I look to God, as I cry out to God, have mercy on me, also a sinner. Saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, I would give my strength, my life, for this gospel, to serve and honour the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, may God help and may he at this time provide for the cause of his name, for the cause of Jesus Christ, that this would go forth and that the gospel would go forth and that the word of God might be preached and that people would be convicted and converted. There is a work going on and, oh, by God's grace, I pray that it would prosper. And that also that God would prosper all those who are preaching his word and preaching the gospel to sinners where they are in the open air in this nation at this time. Well, I want to come to a consideration of the World Cup. The football, I mean, perhaps not everybody is aware that the World Cup is going on in Qatar at the moment. And many countries are there. Um, to um, play football and this is a place that has caused great controversy I, I don't want to focus on all of that controversy but the question was raised why was it taking place in Qatar and it seems that there were bribes that exchanged hands and things like that so it's a usual story of corruption and um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, all of these things but at this moment in time the World Cup is taking place in Qatar now I myself enjoy international football matches and uh, I like to watch them but I very seldom get the chance that's because I don't have a television 
and perhaps this is the one time when I feel tempted to buy a television, but I haven't and I'm not going to. Also, there is not much time and there isn't time to waste watching a large football tournament for me and for those who are serving the Lord. Also, many in the world worship football, they worship football stars, they go after them and this is their idol, this is their God. This is um, a, almost like a heathen temple sacrifice that's taking place for some people in Qatar at this time. I remember many a number of years ago, working as an A&E doctor, that <clears throat> the departments would be almost empty when there was a football match on, that nobody would come to A&E at all when there was football on because they wanted to watch the football. There would be a huge rush at the end of the match. But it meant that doctors who were in accident and emergency could watch the football themselves on telly very often without being disturbed. One of the few perks of the job at that time. But there then came a day when the government decided that it should put, or the NHS decided that it should put large screen televisions in all the accident and emergency department waiting rooms. And people would then come to A&E to watch the football and the whole families would show up and watch the match. The waiting room would be stuffed to the gunnels and um, they would always be able to find somebody to book in um, to see the doctor. So we no longer were able to watch the football, but at the same time we were being paid to work as doctors, so we had no grounds for complaint. But for some people, football is idolatrous. People go wildly excited. They paint themselves in different colours. They expend vast sums of their money on football memorabilia or on uniforms or uh, on uh, all kinds of different things. But as Christians, we can't go down that road. We can enjoy a football match, but to be fanatical, but to be sold out for football is something that a Christian cannot do. It's a form of idolatry. As Christians, let's be modest in these things. Let's also recognise this, that a nation's greatness isn't measured by whether or not it wins the World Cup. I'd love to see England win the World Cup, but I fear that if we win the World Cup, we might measure ourselves as a nation by that cup. We might think that we're better than other nations. We might think that we are better people, more righteous people, or more capable people, but we aren't. We are a country. England is a country under the reproach of sin. England is a, a country under the wrath of God. England is a country under the judgments of God, increasingly so in our days. And if we found ourselves as such winning the World Cup, it might be that it would take people even further from God, even further into their own security, even further into believing that they have something or something good or something better about them that commends them to God. And there's a sense in which if God wanted to destroy England, one of the, the ways he could do it was just hand us over and, and give us the World Cup. And um, it could be a disaster for us. The most important thing isn't whether we win the World Cup. The most important thing is that it's irrelevant. It's absolutely irrelevant. The most important thing is what we do with the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a nation, football is irrelevant to that. Football is a diversion. For many, it's a form of idolatry. Who needs Jesus Christ when you have a football team or a football star, a poster of your football stars in your bedroom or whatever you have? Jesus Christ is the saviour of the world. Nothing is more important than that we should find Jesus. Nothing is more important to England at the present time than that the English should turn from their sins and that the English should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and that the English should find that salvation that comes from God through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Now, there was an article in one of the newspapers yesterday about the English team wanting to wear armbands which had the phrase, One Love, written on them. Now, the reason for this is because the English team wanted to support LGBTQI plus rights in Qatar, an Arab Muslim country. The team backed down when they were told that the players would receive yellow cards for wearing the armbands. A yellow card is a form of um, penalty against a player in football. And this would affect their ability to play throughout the... or may have affected their ability to play throughout the World Cup. And of course, 
this caused a, a storm of um, criticism and discussion over the whole thing. But the point is this, when they use the phrase one love, this is not the truth. And it never can be the truth. Let's, let's unpack this. By saying one love, what they're saying is, it doesn't matter who you love, whether they are the same sex as you or the opposite sex from you, it really doesn't matter. What they're saying by saying one love is saying that love is love, irrespective of what the focus of that love is. Now, of course, there are certain expansions of that into things such as polyamory, where you have groups of people who are married together, not just one individual with another individual and things like that. It expands into the uh, realm of paedophilia, where paedophiles, people who have inappropriate uh, sexual desires towards minor persons, are now being called minor attractive persons, MAPs, MAPs, in an attempt to de, um, de almost aiming to decriminalise paedophilia, which is which is a gross and wicked sin and one which needs to be repented of and put away and one which children need to be protected by the state. They need to be protected by the church. They need to be protected by their parents. So let's unpack this phrase, one love. In the Bible, what, which the England players wanted to wear on their armbands, but then decided not to. When we say that a person can love another person, this is absolutely true. When we say that a person can love a person of the same sex, this is absolutely true. A father can love a son. A son can love his brother. Two people who came from through school together all their days, but are now um, separated, but are uh, 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 two women or two men can love each other as friends. And there's nothing wrong with that love. And there's nothing wrong with the quality of that love or the nature of that love or the foundation of that love. But when we talk about people introducing sexual practices into that situation then it's no longer love. Paul talks about those who burn in their lust one for, towards another. And he's not, he's not talking about love. He's talking about within a same-sex context that this sexual desire and this sexual orientation is described by Paul as lust. Not as love. Love is appropriate when it is consistent with our human nature. And the Lord... God says through his word, through the Bible, in Romans chapter 1 again, that, that this is against nature. It's not against nature for a man to love another man in a manly way. It wasn't against nature for David to love Jonathan in a manly way. It wasn't against nature. It was to the glory of God that two brothers in Christ, Jonathan and David, loved each other with Christian agape love, to the glory of God, because they had served God together, because they shared the same Saviour, because they had uh, suffered together in the Gospel, <clears throat> and loved God, and loved each other with Christian agape love. There was no sexual component to that, none whatsoever. No lust, no sexual component, nothing of that sort. So if we take sexual desire, sexual lust, and what the Bible calls inordinate affections, and we d redefine them as love, then we and then we call that one love. We are actually, we are actually bringing sin into the situation, and we are defining love in a way that the Bible does not define it. It defines it as lust. It calls it inordinate affection. In other words, whilst man has been created to be heterosexual, heterosexuality is normal. Heterosexuality is what the way God has made us. It's consistent with nature. It's consistent with creation, which God said was very good. To love, to lust, to have sexual desires for somebody of the same sex is inordinate affection. It's ordinated or it's, it's, it's turned in the wrong direction. It's focused on the wrong object. It's focused on the wrong thing. It is against nature. Again, Romans chapter 1 speaks about women burning with lust one for another, men burning with lust, one for another. This is not love, this is lust. This is not appropriate, this is inordinate. This is the going after strange flesh. And then of course we might think of the practices that come out of that, practices which are abominable before Almighty God. So that when we talk about love, 
we talk about a love, different types of love, but the only appropriate ex place for the expression of love in a sexual context is within the lawful married bond. Anything else is lust. But again, the Bible telling us that marriage is honourable among all and the bed is undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So even within a heterosexual context, it's not love if we lust after somebody, if we lust after their body, if we lust after sex with them, if we give ourselves to that behaviour, if we give ourselves to fornication. But how much more so is it not love if it is inordinate affection to someone of the same sex? Now let me pause there and say this, that because of my recent visit to the IFTCC conference, the International Federation for Therapeutic and Treatment Co Choice, where they are very concerned about these things as Christians, that, that first of all, we need to recognize this as sin. Secondly, we need to repent. And then also, we may need the help of others to help us to both understand and deal with this. Now, this is something that's voluntary. This is something that is done by people who want to do it. It's not forced. There's no cruelty involved. There's no um, evil things going on whatsoever. But we must recognize the inordinate nature of same-sex attraction. By definition, it's inordinate. Nature itself tells us that this is the case. So when these players were planning on wearing a One Love armband, they were really promoting what is not true. They were really pr promoting a falsehood. They were promoting that the idea that love and lust are the same thing. We know that this has been going on in the. Uh, we know this has been going on. We've been programmed and conditioned through television, through movies, through all of these things, through dramas, and all of these things through society for a very long time. That lust and love are the same thing. So we end up with a situation where we have uncontrolled, unbridled, unrestrained lust, even in children, and we have a very shallow, very very shallow view of love. Love is Jesus Christ dying on the cross. Love is the righteous dying for the unrighteous. Love is the good dying for the bad. Love is the Lord Jesus Christ stretching out his arms and allowing the nails to be driven through his wrists and through his hands into that wood. Love is him being lifted up between the heavens and the earth become a curse for us. That is our example of love. And of course love isn't just between two people who are romantically involved. Love can be between any people. Holy love, pure love, non-sexual love, non-lust. As Christians we're called on to love all people. We're to do so in holiness with Christian love. So if one love armbands are warned, they're, prom warned, they're promoting something which isn't true. They're promoting the idea that lust and love are the same thing. But lust and love are never the same thing. Lust is lust. It's a sinful thing. Thou shalt not covet, the Bible says. God says in his Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And God's commandments are very broad, and these things extend to all of the all of the behaviour of mankind. All of our behaviour is covered by the Ten Commandments, and it includes inordinate affection and going after strange flesh. May God open people's eyes to see that. May they learn to desire a better love, a love that is real, a love that is true, a love that is unconditional. A love that goes out to the unlovely and the unlovable and the unloved. A love that comes from God, a love that's revealed in Jesus Christ. A love that by the Holy Spirit is shed abroad in the hearts of his people so that they can not only love their friends and not only love their families, 
but by God's grace they can love their enemies. A love that shows us and marks us out to be who we are when we're Christians. May God shed his love abroad in our hearts. May our country once again learn the difference between lust and love. And by doing so, may the country once again find the love of God that is revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his death and in his resurrection. Father, I pray you'd awaken this country and many other countries like it. Father, I pray that people will get tired of pursuing their lusts. I pray that people will come to the end of themselves and I pray, Lord, that you would show them a better love. I pray you would show them the Lord Jesus Christ on his cross, dying in the place of sinners, Lord. I pray that they would begin to understand the love that it took to send Jesus Christ into the world to be the saviour of the world. I pray that they would cry out to him and look to him where he is now, Lord, no longer on the cross, but today resurrected, reigning in heaven, seated on the throne of heaven, ready to save, ready to deliver, ready to have mercy on all those who come to God through him. Father, thank you for the salvation that is ours in Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I want to move on now to the book of Esther. And the book of Esther, we're going to come today to this really important question of, of how should I as a Christian stand and when should I as a Christian stand? And uh, I was going to read just first of all here. Well, last week we were considering um, Esther being involuntarily taken to the king's house and how in some ways Ahasuerus became a type of Christ because um, he took me to his banqueting house and his banner over me was love. Uh, speaking of the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus loved to us again. But this week we're changing the topic, we're looking at something different. We see the rise of Haman, the Agagite, and we see also the um, the uh, work of Mordecai and the stand of Mordecai for the truth. So let's read chapter 3 of Esther. Let us hear the word of God. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him, and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass, when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, that were throughout the whole kingdom of Hasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. In the first month, that is the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur, that is, the lot, before Haman from, the day, from day to day, and from month to month, to the twelfth month, that is in the month Adar. And Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, There is a people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all people, neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay ten thousand talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. Let's leave it there at verse 9, and we'll come back to the second half next week. This week we want to consider Mordecai's stand and Haman's rise. Okay, so let's first of all consider the issue of whether we should stand. Now, as Christians, we're called to be salt and light. As Christians, we are called to stand. As Christians, we will face issues in this world, and we are to be conformed to the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. The idea that as a Christian, I can just keep my head down and let somebody else take the, um, the burden of standing is alien to the Scriptures. 
God might be calling me. He might say to me, this is your task. This is your duty. You're the one who's not to bow to the idol or to, um, to, 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 to give yourself to the worship of Baal or whatever it may be in this day and in this generation. There are many issues that we need to stand on in this generation. We know that. We know that very clearly. And unless we stand, unless we speak up for the truth, unless we say what's true, what's false, what's right, what's wrong, then not only will the nation be confused, but the nation will fall into the grossest immorality and be further from God than ever. As Christians, we are to be salt and light. We are to uh, salt our nation. We are to tell the truth. We are to speak the truth. Throughout our history in this land, we have had people, many people who have gone to prison for the sake of the truth, and we have had people who have died for the sake of the truth, sometimes terrible deaths. And we need to remember that. And we are no different. We're made of the same common clay. We're the same um, people who have uh, difficulty, who are afraid, who have weakness in ourselves, who have no strength in ourselves, who without the grace of God and without the empowerment that comes from God cannot stand up for what's true. <clears throat> One way in which people have been standing in these days is to speak out against abortion. There was an excellent discussion of this on Christian Concerns YouTube webpage last Friday, and you can see that, you can listen to that. We're talking about the exclusion zones around abortion clinics and talking about the false the false accusations made against those who go to those clinics in order to try and help women who don't want to have abortions. But I'm not going to say more on that. You can go and see that. You can go and listen to that excellent discussion um, yourself. But the, that issue is important because there are two issues now. The first is this. Should we continue despite what the law says, to stand against this. Remember that um, in his day, Mordecai went against the law in order to take his stand for the truth. It's clear from the text. But, or should we abide by these exclusion zones? <clears throat> these are important questions for a Christian. There comes a time when the laws of the land are against God's laws. What should we do in that situation? But there's a second issue in this, that, this, that is this. Can a government, can politicians by force of numbers, vote to stop people from praying? Can they stop people from praying in their heads? Is there any place anywhere in the world where they can stop people from praying? There's several issues about this, but it makes me, it, it really grieves me, it makes me very, very upset to know that the government would pass a law against praying in certain places, even standing, praying quietly. Who do they think they are? Do they not know that we're called as Christians to pray always, always praying to God, always with our minds fixed on the Lord, always seeking to love him with all our heart, soul, mind and strength, engaging with him in prayer in our minds. How can they possibly make laws which are against God's laws? Yet they have, that they are doing, it's still going through at the moment, but that they are doing. Should we be outside those clinics praying silently, praying for the freedom to pray, praying that God would enable us to pray, being willing to go to prison just for the act of praying? Perhaps I'll write on my forehead, prayer box and stand there but there should be no no good areas for prayer but when politicians pass a law against praying in a certain place they're passing a, a draconian law against freedom and not only that they're, they're like they're like king canute king canute is a famous english king who thought that he was so powerful that he had his throne set up at the low tide line and he said that he had the power to stop the tide from coming in and of course he got very wet <clears throat> How can the government stop us from praying and how can the government tell us not to? These are issues that affect Christians and these are issues which Christians are going to have to take a stand on in order to stand up for the truth and to maintain our freedoms. And some of us might end up in prison for doing so. We have to decide. As Christians, some of us have never taken a stand before. Perhaps we haven't needed to. Perhaps somebody else has done it. Or perhaps we're just ducking and hiding um, from the issues there are some Christians who are anxious just now because they've never taken a stand on any issue before, but they see the storm coming. They see the encroachments on their freedom. They see that they're going to be called upon to either stand for the Lord Jesus Christ or stand for the big battalions which are on the other side um, in error and in falsehood. And um, there are those who know that they um, must stand. There are those who know that they... Uh, are obliged, they have a duty to stand, those in laboratories, those in schools, those in hospitals, those in courts, those in government, who know that they should stand and that they must stand if they're going to honour the Lord Jesus Christ. 
as I, I said that, that when I was asked by my line manager if I would use transgender pronouns, I heard the question as, will you deny Jesus Christ? And I had the choice. I could have denied him. I could have said, yes, I'll use transgender pronouns and then go on my way pretending that I had fellowship with God, but knowing that at that moment in time I had disobeyed the Lord. There are those who know that they must take a stand, but they don't know how to and they're not ready. And then there are those who are not sure if they should stand. For example, no doubt when Mordecai took his stand, there were many who debated whether or not Mordecai should have taken that stand. There were those who would have said, he's just a troublemaker. Why can't he keep his head down? Why can't he keep his mouth shut? Why can't he just bow down to Haman? And others who said, no, he stood up for the truth. He stood up for the Jewish religion and he is a good man and we support him. And there are those who are not sure if they should stand. Asking advice, they're told, oh, well, keep your head down. If things are not being preached from our pulpits, then how can the people out there in the world take a stand? And one of the saddest things is this, that very often it's Christians on their own who are standing and the pulpits are silent and the ministers aren't taking a stand and the ministers aren't taking the flak. Historically, it was the ministers who were the first to be martyred because they were the ones who were preaching the gospel. Look at the covenanting era. Look at the Reformation. Why are these things not coming from our pulpits? Why are they not being thundered from our pulpits? We need ministers who warn the government. We need ministers who warn the people. We need ministers who are willing to obey God rather than men, even if it's costly. But there are those who are not sure if they should take a stand. Study the word of God. Pray about it. Seek the Lord. There are those who think, well, I'm too weak and I'm too pathetic. Send somebody strong. One of the experiences I've had in my Christian life is there's been a number of occasions when I've prayed and I've asked God to send somebody else to do the work, to take the stand, to carry the can, to take the flak, to pay the price. And God has sent me. And that's, in, that's true of this uh, issue of transgender pronouns as well. I've been praying that God would send somebody else to do it. He sent me. I had no choice. God said, you've been praying for this. This is your duty. This is your choice. You can obey me or you can obey men. What will you do? We shouldn't say like Jeremiah, I'm weak or like Moses, I can't speak because any of us, any of us can be used by God. God can use you. He can use me. It's a question of speaking the truth. It's a question of standing up. It's a question of drawing a line and saying they shall not pass. It's a question of doing what's right. There's too much of an idea in the churches these days that, uh, that as Christians, we have a right to a quiet life. Paul said that we should pray for those in authority, that we might have a peaceable life. This is what it comes from. We're not even praying for that. We think it's ours by right. We think that to be a Christian means just to believe on Jesus, but there's no difference in our life. There's no change. There's no requirements on us. And the Lord comes along and the Lord says... This is the stand you need to take. How do we know that? We know that by the word of God. We know that abortion is wrong. We know that we have to speak out against it as Christians. We know that sexual immorality is wrong and that it's ruining the nation and that it's becoming the government principle in every area of our lives and it's driving the idea that the greatest crime that anybody can commit would be to offend somebody else. And we're silent. But if we're silent, we're not salt and light. If the salt has lost its saltiness, because the salt doesn't want to get hurt, or the salt wants to stand in its own strength and finds that it has no strength, rather than in the strength of God, then iniquity will prevail. People will die. And they will go to hell. And then there are those who feel ashamed. They know they should stand, and they know they're not standing. And they feel ashamed because they're not standing. And they feel that they're denying Christ but they carry on like that for a very, very long time. Is that you, my friend? You should have taken a stand. You can still take that stand. And although you are keeping your place at work, you're keeping your place, you're keeping your status with your colleagues, you're keeping yourself in a situation where you have this unhappy balance between, on the one hand, being friends with the world and seeking to be a servant of God, but knowing that you're denying the Lord by your actions. 
and you feel ashamed and you stay like that for years, decades, eventually that becomes your life, a life of compromise, a life of um, not for following Jesus Christ, not taking up your cross and following him daily. And the Lord can get you out of that. The Lord can make you bold. The Lord can fire you up. The Lord can assure you, like this psalm, psalm um, that we read at the start, Psalm 122, that this psalm will, that this, this, this will um, be the thing that, uh, sorry, Psalm 121, this will be the means whereby uh, you will be strengthened and stirred and sent forth into battle with all the armour of God. There are those who are worried about the consequences of standing. And some will be aware that this week that there was a comment on one of my YouTube items um, from somebody saying that they were going to be forced at work to sign a document which effectively commits them to upholding transgender ideology. What would they do? I can't be that person's conscience, but I can say this, do what God requires of you. And if you're not able to do that, if you're not, if you don't have the strength, if you're not ready, then seek God with all your heart until you are ready. Focus on what God wants you to do. Mordecai focused on what God wanted him to do in the moment, not on the consequences. The immediate consequences and Haman's immediate action made the Jews probably think that Mordecai had brought destruction on them. But that wasn't God's purpose. That wasn't God's plan. Mordecai focused on the task at hand, the immediate task of honouring God, of glorifying God. And he did the right thing. But there are those who are worried about the consequences. Now, some of us will go through trials and tribulations, through flood and through flame for the sake of the truth. The consequences for some people may be very serious. Again, my personal experience when I, when I lost my job initially, I had no idea how I was going to provide for my family. The Lord had mercy on me and upon us. And... There are others who've lost their jobs here in the UK. There is the current case of Hannah, the teacher who lost her job for um, raising safeguarding issues. These, the, there's other cases. You can read about them on the Christian Concern website. Some people who've lost their jobs have paid a heavy price for it. But they've done the right thing and they've honoured God. So we need to be ready to count the cost. And we need to be ready to trust the Lord. And we need to be ready to suffer for the sake of upholding the truth. That is what God requires of us as Christians. And if we're not ready, we need to seek the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there are some who are quite simply unwilling to stand. They won't see the issues or they refuse to see the issues. They won't accept that it applies to them. They won't accept that there is suffering for the Christian. They won't accept that... God might be calling them. They won't accept that they can do something. They won't accept responsibility that if they do nothing, then they become complicit. Every time you use a transgender pronoun, you empower those who are telling little children that if they're a girl, they can be a boy. And if they're a boy, they can be a girl. And who can tell what wickedness and what suffering will follow from that evil thing that's going on in our schools? We must not empower the enemy by our complicity. But there are those who are unwilling to stand. They say it's kinder not to. They say, why should we bring trouble on the people of God? They say, I'm a Christian and that's enough. They say, I'm busy and I'm doing good work, so I'm just going to get on with that. But they're very, very happy for others to go and take the flak. They'd be happy if somebody else was drowned in the sea. They'd be happy if somebody else was burnt at the stake. They'd be happy if somebody else took all of the punishment for, for, for those things. They wouldn't bless that person. They wouldn't help them. They wouldn't encourage them. But when freedom finally came, for example, as it did after the covenanting era, after, 19, after, 19, after 1688 in the Glorious Revolution, for example, they'd be very willing to accept all of the blessings and all of the freedom that came with that. They would have no qualms in not thinking about the sacrifice made of others, they are unwilling to stand. They are unwilling to speak up for the Lord Jesus Christ. They may be prominent people in the church. They may have a great reputation. They may be important in society. 
one of the things that surprises me sometimes is how ready churches are to appoint doctors, Christian doctors, to leadership roles solely on the basis that they're a doctor. Now, of course, there are some outstanding Christian doctors who are elders and leaders in the church, but that must be because they are outstanding Christians, not because they are outstanding doctors. Lord Jones deals with that kind of thing in his writings. And then there are those who want someone else to stand. And I've said this already, that I was the one that said, send somebody else, Lord, and he sent me. That was true of the issue of transgender pronouns, but it's been true in other issues as well. That when we're crying out to God and we're saying, Lord, somebody needs to do something about this. Lord, send somebody. Lord, raise up somebody. I'm always surprised that I haven't been arrested preaching in the open air. Many others have. Now, I hope I don't get arrested and I don't want to be arrested. But having said that, if a man is arrested for preaching the gospel, then that is a very high honour before the Lord. And I have great respect for open-air preachers who have been arrested. Sometimes they're criticised by people in their armchairs who think, well, maybe if they were a little less loud, or maybe if they were a bit quieter, or maybe if they were, maybe if they were kinder, or maybe if they were, if they watered down the message. A number of people have said to me, well, can't you just preach love? Of course you can just preach love, but it won't do anything. If people aren't convicted of their sins, if we don't expose sin, if we don't say what sin is, if we don't say what the consequences of sin are, if we don't say that God calls us to repent, if we just preach love, then people will never turn from their sins. And of course, even then, with our best efforts, if we're being faithful to the scriptures and preaching the Bible, it is only the Holy Spirit who can change men's hearts. There's a whole range of people out there, Christians out there, who love the Lord Jesus. And these are all the different things. Some who are unsure, some who know they should stand but don't know how to, some who aren't standing and feel ashamed, some who won't stand, and some who want, some who want somebody else to stand. But as Christians, when these things happen, we're all called to stand, all of us. Now think about Haman here. Haman was a wicked man. He was an Agagite. Now, the Agagites came from the Amalekites, and God will have war with Amal uh, uh, the Amalekites for generation to generation. So Haman was a natural, inveterate, ongoing, implacable enemy of the Jews. There was some suggestion that, um, that, that in this book here that the Jews were already under suspicion because Mordecai has said to Esther that she shouldn't make her race known. She shouldn't say she's a Jew. And that's even before Mordecai takes his stand. Haman is an unelected official. We said before that Ahasuerus was weak. He was a drunkard. He was a party animal. He was a um, king who um, indulged himself in the lusts of the flesh and in satisfying the desires of the flesh. As a result of this, he was weak. And when a man, a strong willed man like Haman came along, Ahasuerus embraced him. To Ahasuerus he seemed like the answer, the man who could run the country whilst he was away, enjoying his pleasures. And uh, Haman was appointed, and Haman was a wicked man at heart. He was an evil man, he was a terrible ruler, he was a, he was a, he was a dictator, he was a despot. Now from a spiritual point of view, Haman was an antichrist. He was Satan's way of destroying the Jews. After all, if you destroy, destroy the Drew, Jews throughout the 127 provinces, then there'll be no Messiah. And there'll be no ongoing line of David. There'll be no Lord Jesus Christ to die on the cross of Calvary to be the saviour of the world. This was Satan's appointment to destroy the Jews. Many of us sigh over our politicians today. In the United Kingdom, we have an unelected prime minister and he seems to be towing the line of the globalists and of the World Economic Forum, and so do the others. So do does the President of Canada and the President of France and the President or the Prime Minister of New Zealand and so on, and others. There doesn't seem to be any accountability. Democracy seems to be an illusion. We seem to be in the grip of something, and we don't seem to be able to escape from it. This is all part of that ongoing war. We see it here as well. We see that the wicked are appointed to high places and the people sigh. We see that we see that there is no love of the truth here, but a hatred of the truth and a hatred of the people of God in Haman's case. 
Now, Mordecai refused to bow to Haman. Haman, the first thing Haman did was he wanted a law passed that everybody should bow to him. And everybody did. All Jews did. Everybody else did. When Haman came down the street in his chariot, they all bowed the knee. Now, the question is, should we bow the knee? Should Mordecai bow the knee? Well, we know that Mordecai wouldn't bow the knee to Haman. Now, this, this, this is really important. First of all, for the first thing is this. What about the question of bowing the knee? Supposing King Charles III were to come to Hull and uh, I was to bump into him, would I bow to him? Now, there's a large extent here in which this is open to an individual conscience. Because we should never bow to another man if that bowing is idolatrous. If that man has set him up as God, if himself up as God, if that man has set himself up as to be worshipped, as some rulers even in the world today have done, then we should not bow to them because we are worshipping them as God and therefore we are committing idolatry. We cannot bow to them. On the other hand, if by bowing to them we're giving them the honour that is due, and the Bible says we should give honour to those to whom it is due, then maybe we, we, we should bow to them. And I, I think that um, by bowing to um, a British monarch, I don't think one is committing idolatry. One is showing respect. But if one were committing idolatry, one shouldn't do it. But there's also the story of the... Well, first of all, uh, I remember hearing about Princess Diana and some Americans who visited Princess Diana who'd been instructed, and they said, don't bow to her because Americans bow to no one. That's a really interesting thought, isn't it? No American person, however great or small, would bow to anybody, however great or small, from any other nation, or even their own nation. And then, of course, there's the story of the Covenanter. Uh, I think it was Fox, I'm not sure who would not take his hat off in the presence of the king because the king was absolutely equal to him in his eyes and therefore he shouldn't be doing that. There is room for individual conscience in this. Each of us must come to God with our conscience and we must search before the Lord and come to a decision based on our knowledge of the scriptures as to what the right thing to do is. One man will take a stand on one issue but another man says, that's not my issue. I know someone who's paid a heavy price for refusing to wear a face mask. Now, I'm not going to be critical of that because I think that wearing face masks had very little to do with the pandemic and I think it had a lot to do with harming people. That's my own opinion as a doctor. Um, and I hated wearing a face mask. Maybe I was wrong, but I agreed to wear a face mask. Well, this brother in Christ wouldn't wear a face mask. He took a stand. Now that is a matter of individual conscience and it's really important that we exercise our individual conscience. But there are some things which aren't a matter of individual conscience. For example, bowing to people who claim to be God. Now I think there are several reasons why Mordecai wouldn't bow to Haman. First of all, I think Haman was setting himself up in a way which put him above other men. And I think that Mordecai was refusing to bow to Haman because I believe that, this is my own conviction, but I believe that Mordecai saw this as taking away from the worship of God, a form of idolatry. That Mordecai was standing for the truth and saying, no man should be treated the way that we're being required to treat Haman. The second thing is this, that also Mordecai knew that Haman was an Agagite and an inveterate enemy of the Jews. And no Jew should be bowing to an Amalekite under any circumstances. True it was that the rest of the Jews would bow, but Mordecai would not bow. Sometimes God uses one man to take a stand. Sometimes God uses one man to speak up for what's right. And because of that one man stand, the whole nation is saved. You might think of the later chapters of Esther when the people of God are delivered by the power of God all because of one man's stand. Or we might think of Moses uh, before the burning bush and how initially when Moses took his stand before Pharaoh, people thought that Moses had made things worse. But God's plans were far greater. But this is the point. We shouldn't be saying to God, raise up a man, Lord, so that I can carry on in my disobedience. Raise up a man, Lord, so that I can carry on in my fear. Raise up a man, Lord, so I can carry on in my disobedience and my idolatry. We should be willing to be that man or that woman as God directs. 
This doesn't depend upon man. It doesn't depend on who we are. It doesn't depend upon our strength. It can't depend on our strength. We have no strength. Without Jesus, we can do nothing. Without the Holy Spirit, it's impossible. We need and we cry out to God and we pray that God would raise up men, outstanding men of God, anointed by the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel in our generation. Again, if we go look at England or Scotland or Wales, throughout the last 500 years, God has time and again raised up such men. And that these are men that have drawn the people's hearts back to the gospel that God has used. Men like Whit Whitfield and Wesley, men like Spurgeon and others. And we need to pray and cry out to God that he would raise up such men in these days. Men who don't bow the knee to Baal, men who don't compromise, men who don't simply um, worship and eat in the temple of idols and then come and eat in the, temp in the church of God. That's, that's what we do if we take Roman Catholic Mass and then we take communion in, in, in a Protestant church because the Roman Catholic Mass is a, is a, is a, um, uh, it's a um, blasphemous fable and it's a dangerous deceit according to the 39 articles, articles of the Church of England. Jesus cannot be re-sacrificed. Jesus cannot be called down from heaven by a man. Jesus, his, his Jesus, wine does not become the blood of Jesus. Bread does not become the body of Jesus. So you can't take that and then come to a Protestant church and take communion. You're eating, you're eating in the temple of an idol and then you're coming to the Protestant church. And Paul says you can't do that. We need to follow the scriptures we need to show by our lives and by the, the way we behave that we are Christians, transformed by the power of God, bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. And our lives should be consistent. Our lives should be consistent with the calling that we have professed. Now, I might not be somebody who can be a mighty preacher, who can travel on horseback throughout the length and breadth of the land like John Wesley and preach the gospel faithfully for, 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 for 50 years and die at a ripe old age. But every one of us as Christians is called to stand for the truth. Mordecai was called by God. Mordecai was God's man for that situation. Remember how he was surrounded by his fellow workers in the palace and they said, you're breaking the law, and they reported him. Two things about that. First of all, we will always be surrounded by those who will report on us. The whole point about making a stand is that it's made in public. And the second thing is this, it's made in public for the glory of God. Mordecai stood up for the cause of Christ. Mordecai stood up for the truth. Mordecai honoured God when others were not willing to honour God. Mordecai did the right thing. So my prayer, my, my supplication is this, that you and I and our brothers and sisters in Christ would stand up and be counted in this day very exercised on this question of what's going on in schools and the children and how could we ever believe such a lie as to tell little children that if you're a girl you could be a boy and if you're a boy you can become a girl where is the outcry where is the crying out of the church where is this being thundered from our pulpits where is this being pursued these things are these things are, are desperate we are to defend the weak and the fatherless and in a sense one almost feels as though many of these children it's, it's like as though they're fatherless that no one is there to defend them because no one seems to be defending them and how our teachers how our teaching profession got into that situation I have no idea except for this they forgot God they forgot the word of God they turned their backs on the Bible they turned their backs on the truth they turned their backs on Jesus Christ when they did that they spiral downwards into this kind of dark abyss of just darkness, moral darkness. So they, they end up telling little children that if you're a girl, you can become a boy. And if you're a boy, you can become a girl. Such fraudulent falsehood, such wicked deceit. May we be the Christians who take stands, whether it's abortion, whether it's transgender ideology, whether it's some other really important issue issues at work issues at home issues in the church the only answer is that we should pray 
Mordecai could only take a stand because he walked with God. We can only stay, take a stand by walking with God. Not to do so is shameful. Care about it. Care about what the Lord Jesus Christ does in you and through you. Care that your light should shine. But recognize your own weakness and come to God through Jesus Christ for strength and pray for the outpouring of his Holy Spirit and for holy boldness to stand for the truth. Count the cost and be willing to pay the cost for the sake of his honor and glory. Father, we pray that you would help us to stand. We are all weak, Lord. We are sinners as well. Our hearts are drawn away. We want somebody else to pay the price. We want somebody else to carry the can. Father, without your grace, without your strength, without your help, we can't do anything, Lord. We would fail. We would fail as pathetically, as miserably, as completely as Peter did when he denied you three times. Forgive us for the times we have done that, Lord. Restore us, we pray, just as you restored Peter. Oh, Lord, help us to face up to those issues which we must face now. Help us to say, it doesn't go past me, Lord. It's me. I'm the person. I'm the one that you've called to stand. I'm the one you've called to stand here and to keep this patch, even if my sword cleaves to my hand. I'm the one you've called to speak out, to speak up. I'm the one you've called to be salt and light. At times, I'm the one that you've called to, to stand against even the law of the land, Lord, when it's against your law, praying in a place where we are told by the law and by the legislators that we cannot pray, but you say we are to pray always, Lord, and no man has the right to ban someone from praying anywhere, Lord. No one has that right, Lord. The, 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 the government has been foolish in, in, in considering this, Lord, and I pray that they wouldn't pass this. I pray that you throw them into total confusion before they could pass such a law. But if they do pass such a law, Lord, I pray that, that, that the Christians would stand and would pray and would show that they are praying, Lord, in a place where they've been told that they cannot pray. Because if we don't do this, Lord, how can we possibly serve Jesus Christ? And if we don't do this, Lord, how can we possibly hope for the future? What future is there for our land, for our nation, for our people, the people whom we love, the people we share a country with, Lord? Father, we pray, therefore, that you would look upon us, weak, pathetic, trembling, Lord, afraid, vulnerable, Lord. Yet if we know Jesus Christ, Father, if Jesus is our saviour, use us, Lord, use even us. And if we are unwilling, Lord, we're willing to be made willing. And if we're afraid, Lord, help us to get back to your word, which says we can lift up our eyes to the hills whence comes our aid, that God is our aid, that you are our ever-present help, that you are our shield and our exceedingly great reward. Father, have mercy upon us. Oh, Lord, help us in these days. Lord, I pray that that remnant of your church that still lives in England I pray, Lord, that you'd revive your church. I pray that you'd pour out your Holy Spirit on the church. I pray that the gospel would burst forth out of the walls and out of the pulpits and into the streets, Lord. I pray that those who are lost would hear the word of God. I pray there'd be conviction of sin and righteousness and judgment, and I pray that there'd be a turning of the tide. But, O oh Lord, make us a people who have strong confidence in our God, who know our duty, and in the strength of of Jesus Christ alone, stand and speak up for the truth. So, Father, we commend ourselves to you now, praying for the forgiveness of all our many sins. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. <laughs>